Hello, Soundies. Uh, it's always good to push your fader forward at the start of the show. Um, <laughs> hope you're all doing well out there. Today's the 26th of November, 2023. It's great to have you all here. Let's go take a look at our agenda for today. All right, we had a question in the chat at the start here. What is Earthworks? Earthworks is a company which makes microphones. They're based in the United States, and I believe they do their manufacturing in the United States as well. They were started... I believe in the 90s or early 2000s, and they make um, some really nice quality microphones. In fact, we're going to take a look at one today. Just a reminder, this is a workshop, so I have not extensively tested uh, the Earthworks SR117 vocal microphone, nor have I extensively tested the Rode DS2 desktop stand. We're just gonna we're just gonna kind of start using them today and see what we get. So that'll be kind of our workshop for today. We do have a question that was submitted ahead of time, so we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, with that, let's go ahead and jump in. So let's switch over first to the Mac and take a look at Earthworks. So if you come to the Earthworks site, oh, also Jazz had a question, is it time to invest in Earthworks? And I, the answer is, well, first of all, we don't give that kind of, a, that kind of investment advice on the channel here, but... Um, I think they're also privately held. I don't know that you can invest in them necessarily. But uh, in any case, they make microphones. In fact, the microphone that I have used for the live streams here for a very long time um, is the Earthworks Ethos. And that's this one right here. When I first bought it, it was $700. It's now $400, which is a steal. I think it's a great sounding microphone for this kind of purpose. So they make lots of others as well. Um, what we're going to look at here today, though, is what is called the SR117. That's this microphone right here. And um, I used to, on my live stream, actually use the SR314, um, also a great sounding microphone, also a vocal microphone. Uh, what that means, when they say vocal microphone, typically in this context, they're referring specifically to live sound. However, I think this microphone, uh, actually any of these microphones, could be used for recording as well. All right, um, let's take a look at this. So this is this was made, and the idea here is that this is going to compete largely, and let's switch back to the camera for a minute here, Danny, with classic mics like the Shure SM58, which we have right here, and we'll use this as a comparison point with the SR117 in just a moment. Um, but this is this has been this was a staple for a long, long time in live vocals. Um, and so this is kind of to fit in that same space. Now, there's a difference. This is a $99 microphone, and this is a $199 microphone. This is the SR117 right here. So what makes it special? That's the question that we all have to ask ourselves. I think the SM58 is a classic, along with all of its flaws. <laughs> Um, but it is, it's got some really good features too. It's, I mean, some good characteristics, I should say. Um, one of the first microphones I bought and still, still going strong. So let's go back to the Mac here and see what Earthworks says about what makes this one special. So it is actually a condenser microphone as opposed to a dynamic microphone. So the SM58 and most other live, well, not most, but originally I would say a lot of the live vocal mics that were used out there for concerts, house of worship, any sort of live application, um, were typically dynamic microphones. And the difference here with the SR117 is it, it is actually a condenser microphone. So it, um, it has a, it, in theory, you shouldn't need nearly as much gain. Um, it has, uh, they say, this is, this is off course marketing talk here. And I should disclose also, Earthworks did send this to me. They also sent me the desktop stand, which we're going to, or Rode sent me the desktop stand, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. But they have not uh, obviously told me what to say. They haven't, re obviously it's a live stream. They haven't, re <laughs> they haven't reviewed what I'm going to say beforehand, just so that that's uh, really clear to everybody. Um, this is marketing talk here. It's transcendent clarity is easy to mix right out of the box without any special corrective actions. And it's exceptional pattern control across all frequencies offers maximum feedback rejection. But that's only half the story. So one of the things in live sound in particular is you have to be worried or concerned about, not worried, but concerned about potentially feeding back. That's when the sound makes its way out of the loudspeakers back into the microphone and then it creates this loop and starts making these very unpleasant very loud 
uh, feedback sounds. Um, so, so these are kind of it's, it's three of the main headlight features from the point of view of Earthworks is exceptional plosive protection. We'll test that in just a minute. Uh, extremely high gain before feedback, and then balanced frequency response. And we'll we'll take a listen to that as well. This is um, this video here was interesting. They actually had a number of plosives in the video <laughs> when the person is talking, uh, which I thought was interesting. They did say that they didn't apply any sort of processing. They were recording uh, the SR one seventeen into an Earth, or sorry, an Allen and Heath SQ five mixer, and uh, there were some there were a few plosives. It sounded pretty good overall, uh, but there were a few plosives. Uh, what I want to pull up here, here we go, here are the things that I'm interested in. So here's the frequency response chart. Uh, you can see it's pretty flat. Until you get up to 10k, there's a little bit above of a bump, a little dip before, and a little bump up after 10k. Exceptionally neutral, um, if you believe the charts, and, you know, that can vary from mic to mic, from copy to copy, if you will. But we'll take a listen here in just a minute. And then here's where it, it uh, gets, it's, or here's the polar pattern graph. This represents the sensitivity of the mic on the front, so and it and it shows different frequencies here. I know it's a little bit difficult to see, but in short, it is ac it is actually quite consistent across frequen frequencies. It does have a little bit of a supercardioid polar pattern, so there is a little note on the back here that is picking up um, a, a tiny bit from the back. It's not perfectly cardioid, um, but of course, it is most sensitive on the front. Falls off at the sides at ninety degrees. It's fallen off. Um, what, like five, six, seven dB by the time you get to 90 degrees, and then it falls off a lot more here at the rear of the microphone. And again, as I said, quite consistent across frequencies, especially here at the lower frequencies, very, very consistent. When you get to the higher frequencies, they've still maintained some really good control there. But overall, looks like a uh, pretty good super cardioid polar pattern there. Uh, specifications wise, we'll put these up on the screen here. Um, this is actually not nearly as sensitive as most condenser microphones that I used. In fact, when we do our tests here, you'll see that I have the gain set to 57 dB, which is quite a lot for a condenser mic. Um, so you don't need quite as much as the equivalent dynamic microphone, but you do need a substantial amount. It's not the kind of thing like with most condenser mics, you only need somewhere in the 40 some dB of, of gain. In this one, we, we definitely needed 50 some. Um, it does require phantom power, of course, and it does draw 10 milliamps. So just something to keep in mind here if you're working with a field recorder, especially the Zoom field recorders, which um, can only su they can supply 48 volt phantom power, but they can only supply so much current. Um, and that's one of the things that the Zoom recorders are interesting. They have a tendency to be very power efficient, but that also means that they can't necessarily deliver as much as some microphones might need. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, they can handle sound pressure levels up to 140 dB SPL. So you can put this right against a, like a guitar cabinet and, and amp that if you needed to do that. Um, let's see. The self noise is rated at 20 dB A weighted. So it's not the quietest microphone in the world, but um, again, does an okay job. We'll, we'll see here in just a minute. 74 dB signal to noise ratio. I think we'll leave it there. All right, let's come back to the, um, let's actually go to the overhead camera here. So you're going to see Danny a little bit here. We have a new camera. Um, is that really dark? Mm -hmm. It is pretty dark, isn't it? Okay, well, um, let's go back to the main camera then. We'll come back and tune that camera in. Um, so here I have, this is the, by, by the way, the Rode DS2, the desk stand. We'll talk about that in a minute here. But here is the SR117. We'll put it right up here. On the desk stand, I have a sound blanket that this is resting on, so that's why you see it give a little bit when I set it down. Let's go ahead and switch over and let you hear what this sounds like. Okay, we are now on the Earthworks SR117 right here. I'm probably 7 to 10 centimeters off the front of the microphone inside the corner of my mouth, aimed at the corner of my mouth here. And this is what it sounds like. It sounds different than the ethos to my ear. Does it sound more mid-rangey to you? Nasally? Yeah, that's... Here's the secret. This probably sounds more like my voice than this does. Is that true? I'm asking Danny. Uh, I'm not...
Maybe I'm not sure. I, I you would have to talk without any amplification. Okay. Okay, back on the SR one seventeen here. So, um, I actually think, based on my ear, I think this is actually closer to my actual in person voice. Um, but it does sound; it is more sensitive in the mid range uh, frequency, somewhere maybe around one kilohertz to two kilohertz. It does seem to pick up a bit more of that than this other microphone, the Earthworks Ethos, does on my particular voice. So. Um, what that means is that it's pretty neutral sounding, actually. And that may, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's not great, Curtis. <laughs> it might not be great. It's not necessarily a flattering mic. I think it's uh, pretty neutral. And so I think the idea is that you could use it on lots of voices. You could EQ it a, a touch and see where that gets you. So let's pause there. Uh, sounds more crisp, according to Jazz. Okay, good. Uh, will Curtis test it on his drums? We can, we can do. Not today, but uh, here. It's cleaner, probably more accurate, yes. I assume there's no processing on it now. Let's just confirm that. We're using the, we can use the other camera for this. So let's switch to that other camera again, Danny. Okay, so what we can do, there's Danny, wave, hi. <laughs> um, let's see here, nope, we're going the other way. We're gonna go over here, and if we pan, there it is, it's the Mackie DLZ. So we're using the Mackie DLZ today, and we have a little pan tilt zoom camera that we're using for the first time here. So that's what that is. All right, we can switch back to the other camera. All right. Um, all right. You're playing with it. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> trying to get it back to where it needs to be. Okay, there we go. All right, where were we? Um, so let's apply a little bit of EQ and see where we get. So if you'll give me just a moment here, I'm going to move this over. Let's let's actually look at handling noise while we're here. So I'm going to pop this off the stand here. I'm holding the mic. Checking one, two. Checking, checking, one, two. If you hold it firmly, of course, good. A little bit of noise there as I switched hands. And... Can hold it a little farther away get up a little bit closer there's definitely whoa some proximity effect so obviously going to be some of that let's do a plosive test here so peter piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers peter piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers did you hear much in the way of plosives when, it, especially when, it was in when it's in the front yeah definitely peter piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers one second. Peter Piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers. So that manages it. So we just put a foam cover on there just to see what that would do. Uh, pull that back off. Okay, let's, uh, let's get a demo of the polar pattern here. So I'm talking into the front of the mic at zero degrees, directly on axis. Now I'm gonna go ahead and turn. We're now off axis, 90 degrees. You're hearing mostly reflected sound. You can't hear anything. You can't hear anything? Uh-uh. Uh, when you're talking in front, but not. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay, Yeah. No, I'm just saying. Okay, <laughs> starting back at zero degrees. Then we're gonna go ahead and turn till we're 90 degrees off axis. I'm hearing a little bit of reflected sound, but a lot of attenuation. And then coming here to the back of the microphone talking into the back of the microphone at 180 degrees off axis. Coming back to 90 degrees, here we are at 90 degrees, and now here we are back on axis at zero degrees. So the question that you're looking for here is, does it color the sound substantially or does it primarily just attenuate the levels? And to me, that sounded pretty neutral. Didn't sound like it colored the sound a whole lot. So, all right, any, any did you have any thoughts? You don't have to. No, 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 th no thoughts at the moment. Okay, let's go ahead and put this mic back up on the stand. I'm gonna just see what happens, how it sounds. A little bit of sound, okay. All right, let's get into 
the channel here and let's apply a little EQ. So I do have a high pass filter filter on, excuse me. I did have one piece of processing. Here is without the high pass filter. Peter Piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers, lots of plosives. Peter Piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers. Turn that low uh, high pass filter on. Peter Piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers. Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead and just apply a little EQ. So what I'm going to do is we'll go here. We're at one kilohertz and There we go, when we're at one kilohertz. There we go, frequency, okay. And we're gaining up, so this will sound very, very mid-rangey. Yuck. And I'm gonna cut, there's a three, three dB cut at one kilohertz. And the Q is about two, so it's a, it's a kind of a gentle cut, something like that. And that is what it sounds like there. A little bit less mid-rangey. Let's go and drop that to 950 hertz. Here's a massive cut. Here's a 10 dB cut at, you can definitely hear that. Uh, we probably wouldn't do that, but just to sweeten it up a touch, maybe a 4 dB cut there. And then let's go get number three there. No, let's go get number one. Put that at 2.2 kilohertz and do another cut about 3 dB. So there are a couple cuts in the mid-range. So one at one kilohertz, one at two kilohertz, each about three or four dB. And then let me go ahead and turn that off. And this is without the EQ, checking one, two, three. And you can definitely hear that more mid-rangey. So the thing is, is that if you're doing a solo mic like this, just someone talking into it, that sometimes you may want to sweeten it up like that. Now, when, if you're putting um, vocals into a mix of music, you don't necessarily want to cut all that mid-range out because sometimes that's what carries through the mix really, really well. So um, just a, something important to keep in mind here. So even if right out of the box, I probably wouldn't choose this as my favorite sounding mic on my voice. Um, it EQs very nicely and easily. And I think it, it gets you a nice, even response across the fre frequency spe uh, spectrum so that you have a lot to work with in terms of EQ to kind of sculpt the sound a little bit. So overall, it's a pretty good sound. Now, one other thing um, that is of interest here, the, one of the first questions we asked is, you know, the, the SM58 is a $99 mic. This is a two or $199 mic for the Earthworks. Um, what justifies that? Well, I'm not sure because I'm not Earthworks and <laughs> maybe it's the manufacturing. I'm not positive. But one other thing that they've, they've included, at least through the middle of January, is that when you do buy an SR117, you also get an uh, Isotope RX Elements license as well. So that, that adds some additional value there. Okay, let's go to the chat and see what we have there. So, Shoji, can you show the on-axis frequency response of the SR117? Yes. Um, did you mean the graph or did you mean, we did a, we did a little demo there. I think we already caught that, but if you wanted the graph again, we can put that up on the Mac here. Um, just so that you're aware again, super cardioid, it does attenuate by about 20 DB at the, at the rear lobe, the rear tail. Um, and then at 150 degrees, it basically attenuates 25 DB at 90 degrees. It looks like it's attenuating about what, seven 7 dB, 8 dB, somewhere around there, depending on the frequency. So good question, Shoji. I'm going to move the mic just a touch here. Ah, uh, Matt, David Blacker, the engineer that found a DBX, uh, and when he sold it, he retired, but then started creating mics. That's right. So David Blackner, I think it was his name, uh, started DBX of the, you know, the company that makes the DBX 286, for example, if you're familiar with that vocal channel strip. Um, he started that. He actually did first noise reduction was, I think, some of his early processors that were very popular with DBX um, and later created a variety of other um, different 
processing gear. Then he then he went and founded um, Earthworks after that. I think he also owned a restaurant. <laughs> so he did a number of different things. But his main thing was that um, he believed that when you create a microphone or any sort of audio gear, it should be able to handle frequencies well above human hearing range, which we typically call 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, so a lot of their early microphones... Uh, when they when they did the engineering and the design on them, they would try to make them um, even in terms of frequency response up well past 20 kilohertz, depending on the microphone. So, um, and they always use small diaphragm condensers. They never use a large diaphragm. And the reason for that is that they could achieve the, that relative neutrality up beyond 20 kilohertz doing that. So that's a little bit of history of Earthworks. Uh, SR 117 sounds more mid-range. It absolutely, it absolutely does. This is the Earthworks Ethos is definitely a more of a broadcast kind of sound, and it and it has a scoop, um, I would say, in the middle. So um, the uh, SR 117 is definitely, I think, actually more neutral, to be honest. So it's a little bit closer to reality. I'm sorry to break it to you. This is my actual voice, <laughs> or it's closer to this at least. Matt says, the studio I helped at only basically had two mic brands, Earthworks and Neumann. From running church sound for five decades there, uh, Earthworks piano mic is the best I ever used. Yeah, there's some really nice, nice microphones from Earthworks. They used to be very, very expensive. So it wasn't until within the last... I want to say four years or so when you started getting more like sub $1,000 microphones from Earthworks, or at least some that were more uh, accessible for people. They, I think they also make some mics that a lot of drummers use as well, uh, which are quite omnidirectional mics in many cases. I bet the restaurant music sounded sweet. I bet you're right. <laughs> Jazz. Uh, what PTZ camera are you using? I am using an OBS bot tail air um more to come on that but it seems to seems to be all right i don't necessarily love uh it does it is it it's capable of sending video and audio via ndi if you buy an additional license so it, the, the, its whole thing is it's it's a it's one of the more affordable ptz cameras out there it's i think is it 499 or 599 dollars but if you want to enable it to, to send video via NDI, you have to buy, first of all, the USB-C to Ethernet adapter, and then you also have to buy an NDI license. So what they've done is they've been very aggressive about the price point um, by actually extracting some functionality and making it an, an add-on type of thing as opposed to building it into the camera itself. Most PTZ cameras will have, if they do have NDI support, for example, they'll have it from the start, or they'll have an Ethernet port built into it, as opposed to this, which you have to actually use a dongle. In this case, we're just running HDMI out into the ATEM switcher today. So, okay, all good there? All right, well, let's switch on back to the Earthworks Ethos. Okay, a couple things. I did not um, turn off one of these fans. Give me a second here. Oh, and I bumped the camera. So <laughs> there we turned off that fan. Let me just, um, let's go back to the other, um, to the overhead camera, Danny. I'm going to just show this stand here really quickly. So um, kind of hard to see, but I want to hold it up here. So this is the Rode DS2 microphone stand, and it has an adjustment point there and an adjustment point here. Um, this is interesting. So Desktop stands are an interesting thing. I've had one from on stage for years and years and years, and it's just a cheap. Um, actually, why don't you cut back to the main camera? I'm going to go grab it and show it. Rode actually used to have one like this too, the DS1, presumably. I never used it, but let me go grab it. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Um, so this is uh, some the, the the OBS bot evidently just went to sleep. I think <laughs> Danny was pointing at it when I came back in. Well, look at it was missing you. 
It was it oh it was trying to track me. Yeah. Oh okay, it was trying to track me and then it lost track. So these things happen. In any case, um, this stuck. is. It's stuck. It keeps. Okay. All right. So this, you've seen uh, desk stands like this before. So just kind of a cast iron base uh, metal stand. You can adjust the height. And this one I have a Rycoat quick release, so that's that's not part of the actual stand itself on the top. But we use this a lot when we're, we're you know demonstrating large diaphragm condenser mics or using them out in the, the main studio there. Um, so we can go ahead and go out to the what to the overhead camera there. There we go. Yeah, so you've seen these before. Now, what's different here, of course, about the road, this is, it's got a really pretty heavy base. What do you think that's made out of? Danny's gonna... There's rubber and metal, and maybe something in the middle. Yeah, so it's pretty well weighted. It can hand, evidently handle up to 900 grams, and instead of just going straight up, it has these, uh, these knobs here. We'll go ahead and zoom in a touch here. There we go, something like that, okay. So we have these knobs here, nice kind of rubberized knobs. <laughs> so we just dropped it there, but you can adjust its height a little bit differently there. Um, but because of the weighted base, it can still handle up to 900 grams. So that's gonna be useful for things that have like the traditional um, rubber band style shock mounts. And then, of course, you have another knob up here for the top to adjust the angle of the, the bit that holds the microphone. It does have a 3 8 inch thread on the front, plus a locking nut. Um, let's see if I can show that to you. So it's not a 5 8 inch, which is kind of interesting. In the United States, we almost always use 5 8 inch, but almost everywhere else in the world, 3 8 inch. So that's what it includes there. It does include an adapter that will actually take this to quarter inch. So if you wanted to put little lights on your desk, for example, you could do that. So it's more than maybe more than just a microphone stand. Um, but most um, most microphones, when they come with a clip, they also come with a 5 8 to 3 8 inch adapter. So that's what we're using here. And then to get the, let me just, um, it's not coming down here, but um, so that you can get the clip oriented the right way, what you do is you get it in the general area and then use the locking nut to lock it there. It's a common thing you see on um, a lot of stands. Not a lot of stands, but some stands. So that is the DS2. We'll, we'll spend some more time with that and see how that works. Um, I'm out of the frame. We'll spend some more time with that and see how it works. But overall, looks like a pretty good pretty good deal. I was a little astonished at the price. <laughs> it is ninety dollars U.S. Call me a little skeptical. Um, it is really well built, um, but I think a lot of people are going to think twice before spending ninety dollars on a a stand like that. I don't know. We'll we'll give it a try and see. These, for example, I think you can get for about twenty dollars. Um, it's angle. not, but the problem they don't angle, and the, the reality is, is that the base, um, this one, you'll note, they're using physics in their favor. The, the arm that comes up from the base is located at the back, so you get some additional leverage there. The problem I've had with this and using any sort of microphone with a traditional shock mount, like a large diaphragm condenser mic, um, is this thing just will tip right over. So I have to put additional weight on the base to make it hold those. So in any case, that's that's a quick look at the DS2 from Rode microphones. As I said, I think they're gonna have a little trouble selling a lot of these at $90 each, um, especially when you get something like this for 20, just because a lot of people don't realize until they get the microphone stand home that, let's go ahead and switch to the main camera, that the, um, you know, that this is going to tip over, <laughs> even with its cast iron base. So in any case, one other thing I'd like to try really quickly is I'm going to go ahead and connect 
the SR317, or put the SR317, or 117 back on here. Sorry, I was getting confused there with the SR314, the Earthworks mic I used to use, and this. Okay, so let's do that. And let me switch back over to this. Okay, we're back on the SR117. You can hear that okay? Yep. Let me bump this down. So I'm going to touch it down here at the bottom. Ooh. Okay. Actually does okay. Um, I've heard worse. Let's go ahead and switch over to the SM58 so that we can hear what that sounds like. Do an ear cleanse here. We're back on the uh, Earthworks ethos for the moment. And I need to come into channel three and turn off the phantom power. As we go to the SM58, whoa, I almost knocked that over. And that was on the road stand, but it's on a sound blanket to be fair, as opposed to actually on the desk. Okay. Switching over to the SM58. Okay, here we are on the SM58. And so you can hear what that sounds like, SM58. She sells, well, yeah, a little bit more sibilant, I think. She sells seashells by the seashore. Plosives. Peter Piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers. That seems to manage some of the sibilance as well. She sells seashells by the seashore, a little bit. And then polar pattern wise, here I'm talking into the front of the microphone and we're at 60, let me see here, 62 dB of gain. So talking into the front of the microphone, let's go ahead and turn off to 90 degrees off axis so that it has attenuated the sound quite a bit. And then here we are talking 180 degrees off axis into the back of the microphone. And we're back at 90 degrees off axis and then back at the front of the microphone at zero degrees. So there's some comparison with the Shure SM58 and the SR117 from Earthworks. Okay, back on the ethos again. So curious what people heard there in terms of differences of the SM58 versus the SR117 and what people's thoughts are. I think um, I think for a lot of voices without any EQ, this might sound better, a little bit better. It has a different, it has more character to it for sure, um, but it is probably also less neutral, I would say. So I'm gonna go ahead and this mic is not what I'm talking into at the moment. What do people have out in the chat there to say? Uh, Rode looks like a really nice desktop stand. It does. I think it's it's the price is going to be tricky. <laughs> it does seem like a nice stand. This is talking about the joints. It also keeps the stand out of your way. That's true. I agree with that mashup. So I do I do like it. Don't get me wrong. I think it's that Rode is just going to have a little bit of trouble convincing people that it's worth ninety dollars. Um, for those that have a little bit more to spend. From my point of view, just from what I've experienced so far, definitely worth the additional cost. Um, but that's a that's a lot of additional cost versus a twenty dollar stand. I think people are still. In oh, okay. All right. Let's go uh, back to our agenda here. We'll take a look at the question that was submitted ahead of time. This will be an interesting one. So we're going into the production sound world now. Um, Philip says, I'm in the market for a new recorder, and I was wondering, now that the Plus 4 plug-in, the XL AES, and some decent third-party fader options have been available for the 833 for some time, would you get the 888 again, or would you perhaps choose the 833 if you were deciding on a new recorder today? I, for my part, will be going with the 833 since I feel that it is a smaller, that its smaller size makes more sense for my kind of work, and 12 ISOs are plenty channels for any scenario I see myself working in. I also won't be needing Dante 
and more than the 833's six outputs. So, are the reasons which steered you towards the 888 still valid? Philip asks. Well, um, first of all, nobody cares what Curtis does, really. And nobody should care too deeply about what Curtis does in terms of choosing an 888 versus an 833. But I think I understand your point, Philip. The 833 has become more capable over time now that they've released additional things. So you can add, so there are now some, you, you can use um, more inputs um, and AES as AES capabilities. Um, you've got all the plugins that the 888 has. The only thing you don't have really is Dante. Um, I don't think you can't use the, I don't, I can't remember if the, um, the big control surface that Sound Devices makes, I know it works with the Scorpio and 888. I don't remember if it will work for the 833. It's kind of overkill for the 833 to be honest, but there are some third party controllers or control surfaces that you can use. Um, incidentally, Philip, we use the 833 at my day job at work in our, in our studio. So, um, if I bought it again, when I bought the 888, um, one of the big things I did want was Dante and early in the pandemic, I actually did use it some, um, with Dante. So if I were to buy again, I probably would. It's also important when I am using it 99% of the time it's on a cart not in a bag if I was in a bag most of the time I'd probably opt for an 833 the 888 is pretty big pretty heavy um, relative to the 833 so um, it's not that I necessarily need a lot of channels but I do need I did want that Dante so that was the big thing that that kind of moved me that direction and then for our studio our, the 833 is plenty for what we're doing we have three basically a set with three different desks in it one person at each desk typically. So the 833 does everything we need. So my advocate, I advocate for buying the one that fits your needs the best. And don't, don't discount the reality that a bigger recorder, while it has more features, is also quite a bit heavier. <laughs> so weight matters when you're carrying it around all day long, uh, doing location or production sound with a bag. Um, so I think that's an important consideration. So seems like the 833 will fit your needs nicely. Would it sway my decision at this point? Probably not. I'd probably still go for the 888. But that doesn't mean anyway, everyone else should do that too. It just depends on what you're doing. So cool. Okay. Let's go back out to the chat and see what people have going today. Looks like at the start, um, like Keith, you were getting ready for a production job. That's exciting news. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything, any questions. If you do have questions, go ahead and tag them with at Curtis Jet Audio. That'll make it easy for Danny to find them. And we'll take a look and see what you've got. I think some people are fans of Dante. Okay. Not having Dante is a huge issue. It depends on your needs. Depends on your needs. But yeah, I, I agree. That's why I went with the 888. <laughs> okay, now this is back when you were doing the comparison. Oh, from back when we were comparing the SM58. Sure has a nice out-of-the-box sound. Plosives are worse compared to the Earthworks. The Earthworks is possibly a better tool in the long run for EQ, et cetera. That's my impression overall as well so far. Again, I haven't worked with it extensively, but um, I felt like that with a, with a, like if I have to use a microphone on a lot of different voices, that the Earthworks would probably be a, a nice choice because I can EQ it to really kind of tune it in for that particular voice that's using it at a time. But it's, it's starting from a neutral place, which is a good place to start. The SM58 is not neutral. <laughs> Um, it does have a nice low end that's really, really appealing, but what happens in the mids and the, and the higher end, uh, really depends on the voice in my mind. Um, so yes, well, if I have to just plunk something down and don't have a chance to EQ it, this might sound a little better, certainly on my voice. I think the Earthworks is probably a better tool in the long run. Not having a five eighths is a deal killer. Well, um, on the on the mic stand, I well, um, I have probably sixty three eighths to five eighths inch adapters, and so for me, I don't care. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I can see it's a little bit of a pain um, for those in the United States that have everything else that's five eighths inch. So I don't know why. Sometimes the Americans just like to do it the Americans' way. I don't know why. <laughs> I think we should have switched to metric a long time ago, but it's just, I'm just me. Uh, Fachiri, 
uh, kind of off topic, but how many sound blankets would you recommend bringing for a generic sound location job, like an interview for safety? I usually bring three. It's usually my what I do. That way I can um, kind of manage either side and behind the camera. So usually three has worked out pretty nicely for me. I remember doing that pretty extensively, so three. Hi. Hi. I, I'm not getting some of these. Oh, okay. The chat on Danny's side is a little bit slower than on the encoder side, so she's sort of I'm scratching, waiting. Wait, waiting for them to all come through. <laughs> Um, all right. I mean, I can see what else can I tell you here? Let's, let's talk about this silly camera, shall we? If, while we're waiting for questions to come in. So let's switch over to the silly camera. I don't know. It's not silly, but it's just like first PTZ camera I've ever used. So here it is right here. Um, it looks like it's a higher contrast look. So right now it's using quote AI to track me. So I just turned it off. So if I go like this, it will say, okay, you want me to track. So if I move over here, you can see it follows me. If I move back over here, it follows me here. I got confused when I went out of the room to go get the other microphone stand. Um, so if you're doing a demo and you need it to track you, that can be helpful. So I can go ahead and turn that off by holding up my hand again. And it has a little tally light that blinks when you engage it or disengage it. Um, you can tell it to, you can use your, you can use an app to control it. Um, to do the pan, tilt, zoom manually. So if we want to turn over here, we can do that. <laughs> um, or we can come back. You can see all the messy stuff in my room there. There we go. You can zoom. So we're at two times zoom right now. We can go wide. Here's wide. Here's Danny over here. You can see. There she is. <laughs> uh, we can come up nice and close. How much can we zoom? There's 3.7, 4. We can zoom 4, 4 times. So we'll be doing a review of this in the next little bit. The reason, I've actually had it for several months, and the reason I haven't reviewed it up until now is that you had to use an app on your phone to upgrade the firmware, and it was only working on Android until recently. So now there's an iOS version. So we just got it updated yesterday or the day before, and now we can use it. You can also have it track different objects. So you can actually use, a, there's a little thing where you basically draw a box around something and then it will track that. Um, so that's cool. And as I said before, there's a, so basically to get it NDI capable, you it's a basically, I think a $700, it's $700. Most PTZ cameras are substantially more expensive than that. It's another $700 or $700? No, $700 total. So for the camera, plus the Ethernet adapter, plus the NDI uh, license, it's $700, $699. So that's that. Let's go back to the chat, see what we have going there. Yeah, right as you started that, it, they all came in. They all came in. Here, they, here we go. So. <laughs> all right. We're done camera nerding. Now we're back to sound. And here it comes. Okay, what are your primary microphones that you use on the drum kit from BB Photo? Well, um, <laughs> Danny's laughing right now because I have not played my drum kit in probably 10 years. Since I started this YouTube thing, um, I have not even had time to play drums. So back then I was miking it with, a, with an SM58 on the bass drum, an SM57 on the snare, and then I put up a couple of room mics. I don't remember. There were some condenser mics. I don't remember which ones. Um, so that's the short answer. <laughs> Please don't look to me as an expert on miking drums. Miking drums is a serious art. Um, I have a lot of respect for someone who can mic a drum kit really, really well. So I hope to learn someday. Uh, thoughts for a future episode. Hiding lav mics on talent? It's been a while. Um, we did one, was that earlier this year? Um, but we can do another one. I'm not necessarily super expert there. Again, we haven't been doing as much of that lately. I am looking at um, having Petrushka Mirza come, out, come on the live stream. Um, she is a boom operator and utility sound technician and has written a couple books on the topic. Um, maybe we can have her come on and, 
and kind of lead that discussion. It'd be great to have her input on that. She's doing that all day long. When I did my little episode on the main channel about hiding a lavalier microphone under a t-shirt, um, I actually got that. I, I, I was clear. I credited her. I got that technique from her book. Um, and I, and, you know, I said, well, it takes a while to do it. And she actually commented on the video and said, oh, it takes me 15 seconds. So <laughs> in any case, um, all right, Curtis probably has enough blankets to make a wigwam. Well, maybe sound blankets. possibly are, sound blankets. Um, yeah, I kind of, I kind of did make a room. Walls. So I've got uh, three sound blankets in essence in the main studio space where we do our recording for the main YouTube channel. So three it is. All right, how do you handle shotgun mic on boom arm that changes location during a shoot and has a different sound? Um, are you talking about where you, when you're cueing a microphone back and forth and you're picking up different, the room tone changes a little bit? Is that, I don't know if that's what you're referring. Uh, I found that even a minor, less major change in the mic placement has a big effect on the sound. Yes, definitely, if, especially if you have a more prominent sound floor or noise floor. Um, aiming the microphone different directions, cueing back and forth can definitely change the sound. So that's where dialogue editors and re-recording mixers have a lot of work to do to get it just right. So <laughs> um, in post, you just have to, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll be more aggressive about cutting out the room tone between phrases. Um, they might EQ things to change the noise floor to match a little bit from, you know, from from cue to cue. So if you're doing a two camera shoot, um, you may have to do some EQ to get those different noise floors sounding more similar. So it's not as obvious that a cut has happened or there's a change in the sound. Um, but they might get more aggressive about cutting out the, the, the heads and tails off of clips and then layer in uh, a single source of room tone so that it sounds consistent. Um, so there are a lot of little things like that. It's just tedious, tedious work. You can also use um, Dialog Match. RX has a, that. That's a kind of a higher end thing that works in Pro Tools, but that can also help and make things a lot more automated. Okay. Um, I agree that we should have gone to metric, but those little adapters uh, slip and they're a pain. That's fair. Uh, fair, fair, fair. Yep. Nice plant. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bart. Uh, Bartholomew is his full name. Uh, we think it's a him. We don't even really know. Uh, I don't really know, at least. Um, but in any case, that's Bart, the plant, who adds a little oxygen to the office here. Uh, what's a common use case for Dante at your work? Uh, back when I got the 888, uh, the use case during the pandemic was being able to place microphones in, set them up in a in one room and then being able to mix from a separate room at the office. That was the main use case for me when I originally bought that. What a jerky zoom for the PTZ camera. Yeah, that was the manual zoom. Yeah, it's not, that wasn't smooth. Um, I need to look more into it. Again, just set it up for the first time. This is the first time I've ever actually used it. So it could be that there's a smoother way to do that. I just haven't found it yet. Can you tell us why Mini XLR is, uh, why is Mini XLR not commonly used? It could be a lot handier, I think. Uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It is, I think part of the thing is that it is harder to use larger gauge cabling with Mini XLRs, and therefore it's difficult to do long runs of cable with that. Um, so that's one reason, perhaps. Um, I don't know if they're as easy to solder and, and make on your, I don't really know. I've never, I've never, I've never made a cable with mini XLR connectors. So I've only done it with, with the regular full size XLR connectors. So I think that's the main reason. If I had to guess, it's harder to use the larger gauge cable that you can run for longer distances. So they're fine for short distances and just getting them out, getting audio in or out of a device and then adapting them to the full full size cabling that's easier to keep clean over a longer distance. So by clean, I mean less likely to, to have more shielding in it so that it's less likely to pick up as much noise. 
and electromagnetic and radio frequency interference. Also probably manufacturing. It's probably easier. Any experience with head-worn mics? A uh, tiny, tiny bit. We used them at our last, um, at the Webflow Conf 2023, back in October. All of the talent wore head-worn mics. Um, it, it eliminated all of the issues with clothing rustle, which was great. They're obviously much more um, visible. <laughs> so that is a little cost. But the great thing is as the person turns their head, they have a lot more freedom to walk around and move without distorting the audio or losing the audio as they turn their head away from a lavalier mic. So you can do it either way. But the head-worn mics uh, for presentations like that are a pretty nice choice. I like them. Thank you. You got it. After the live stream, heading out to do what Audio Buff is doing, set up a Christmas concert at one of Nashville's mega churches, 84 wired mics and 12 wireless. <laughs> Glad I'm not running front of house. Oh my goodness, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, but in those cases, typically, and Matt, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but in those cases in, and Audio Buff, Usually you have digital mixers and you set up the scenes so you're not having to go like when you're going from one song to the next, you're not like trying to move around 84 different faders. Um, you've actually got them all pre-configured and you can switch scenes and, and so on and so forth. That's my guess. And that would be the same way to work. <laughs> uh, Christopher says another big use case for Dante is wireless mic receivers. Mm, yeah, so you can put the receivers closer to the source, to the transmitters, and then run Dante from there to wherever your mixer is. That's another good use case. Completely agree. Auto Coffee finally took up, took up your advice to get the Bear Dynamic DT990 Pro 250 ohm headphones on Black Friday discount. Thanks for the recommend. You bet. I hope they work really, really well for you. You'll need, the, of course, the headphone amp to drive them, but they're lovely headphones. Uh, any yeah. chance you'll be looking at the Deity <laughs> Theos anytime soon? Assuming, of course, they get through import soon. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like they're stuck in customs or something. Um, as soon as I get mine, I'll I'll probably cover them here first on the the Sound for Video sessions, and then do a full review on the main channel. But it's uh, end of November. It's the twenty sixth of November, twenty twenty three, and I have not received mine yet. And I put my pre order in, I think, in August or July. August? I can't remember. It's been a while. So yeah, we'll definitely be covering that for sure. Uh, Mini XLR also has lower max current, which affects their use as a power cable. Good point. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, a lot of people just putting in interesting little comments. A lot of little interesting comments here at the holidays. I do have one thing I would like to say. Um, I hope you all, for those that celebrate, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving or whatever holiday you celebrate this time of year. Uh, I made a determination not to buy anything on Black Friday because I didn't need anything. I'm happy to report. Success. Did not buy anything on Black Friday. But for those that already were planning to buy something and you got a great deal, good for you as well. <laughs> That's great. Okay, there's a whole little conversation you'll have to check later on drum miking but here's ah here's drum miking decades ago i was on the genesis sound crew 64 channels of just drums Whew. was that for phil collins well i don't know if that was the phil when phil collins was at the kit or if that was another um another part of the gen genesis has changed a lot over the years so <laughs> Possibly the I don't know if that was the Phil Collins era or not. Phil Collins, I mean Phil Collins on the kit, I should say, era. Oh gosh, I don't, there's a lot of little interesting things. I'm not sure what we want to. A lot of interesting conversations going on in the chat, evidently. Yeah. Uh... Uh, Audio Buff says I run my digital like an analog mixer. Does that mean that you do not set up scenes, Audio Buff? And maybe for your show, it, it isn't necessary, but I would think for some of those shows when you're changing acts or changing from performance to performance that like from choir back to something else, or maybe you just mute the channels. Like you, know, you say, okay, we're back to choir, mute everything except for the choir mics. That can work too. 
Uh, Jazz says you can do all that zoom and pan on the DJI Pocket 3 plus time sync wireless mic to far, two so far and web camera detection in 1080. Apart from some caveats, my P3 is a keeper. Very good. Pocket 3, Let's DJI. Oh, well. Uh, the only PTZ I've used is a Sony FR7, and it's an FX6, basically. 12 grand. <laughs> okay, and then somebody else, your same experience. I reviewed the OBS Tail Air, OBS Bot Tail Air 2, but waited to make the video because of the lack of an iOS app as well. Yeah. Red Tech, um, that, yeah, just, it may end up being useful here on the live stream. I've always wanted to be able to, to pan and zoom, um, zoom in particular, but uh, right now it's sitting up on top of a speaker over here. I need to get it in a better location, but the problem is, oh, maybe we can show this actually. Uh, let's <laughs> no, try. Let's switch time. over. So let's, are, are you switch, go ahead and switch over to the overhead, what we call the overhead cam. So now I can go, can it go up or is it still trying to track me? It was trying to track me. So I've got the clouds up on the ceiling here and that's right where I'd want to put the PTZ camera. So... <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. We got to figure out where to put it exactly, but that's the challenge we're up against. So, okay. Okay. We have just a few more minutes. That's Genesis. Oh, Phil Anchester. Very good. Good. Okay. Now I understand why there were so many channels of drums. That means two? <laughs> two. Uh, I don't know exactly who Chester is, but Phil definitely was on the kit in the early days. Yamaha, massive mixer, but the wireless is on a separate board. Okay, so, um, yeah, I would assume that means that you are setting up scenes, so you're not trying to pull 84 oh, oh. faders up and down no, no. all the time. No scenes for audio buff. Whew, you are a brave man. Good work. What is your recommendation for best bang for buck audio interface? UA Volt 2? I haven't used the Volt 2. We have a 276. I like the 276 a lot with its built-in compressor, which is just a really handy feature for spoken word audio if you just want to do quick and easy. Um, I haven't used the Volt 2, but I think it's basically the same thing without the compressor. So it's not a bad choice. Not a bad choice at all. I have not used the latest generation uh, Focusrite Scarlet. They seem okay. It's, um, it's feature for limiting sound is basically just an attenuator it just pulls the sound like if you get too close to zero db it just reduces your sound level and leaves it there it's not like a limiter um, which just acts momentarily so that's of limited use from my point of view but uh yeah the volt the volt 276 has been good for us oh okay audio buff uses plenty of subgroups so dcas so that means you can pull one fader down to essentially bring an act down, if you will, or a, a particular setup down. If that makes sense. I agree. Uh, Curtis Dead Audio likes playing with his new toy. <laughs> Guilty. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I've been waiting for Theos since August. Heard U.S. Customs has held them up. BNH advised December 13th. So there's a little bit more detail for you all. Um, I, I post my place. I place my pre-order directly with Deity, so I don't know if that means it's going to be coming from Deity directly or from B&H, but uh, hopefully they get through customs, because I did see there was a tweet from Deity some time ago that they were shipping from China, so even if they were on a boat, they would be in customs by now, <laughs> so customs, being stuck in customs makes sense. How does the OBS bot do when panning to saved presets smooth does it do x y at the same time or each axis one at a time great question i will let you know as soon as i figure it out oh here red frame tech says uh does that well with and xyz is all at the same time cool thanks red frame okay all right well, friends, that brings us to the end of another Sound for Video session. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, our workshops are a lot of fun because of you. So 
In the meantime, get out there, make some great sound, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye, everybody.